nice to meet you. <laughs> Very nice to meet you. So we are going to just talk. I think we should freak them out with an awkward silence. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. People hate silences. They get very uncomfortable with them. That was one of the things I loved about playing Alicia Florek, was I just stayed very quiet most of the time and let other people worry. And then she'd just come in with a zinger. It, it makes people nervous. Oh, she's doing it. <laughs> Are you guys nervous yet? So I have a question for you. You do? Go ahead. Yeah. So what's interesting to me is that over six episodes, you went through an arc as Alicia Florek. But at the same time, you were also a person. Mm -hmm. So to me, it feels like there was a dual track. And I'm curious as to whether those two tracks informed each other. Maybe three tracks, because there's Juliana as a woman. There is the actor in this outrageously difficult business. And then there is this archetype you embody, embody in a process of evolution. Can you say anything about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, it's a great question. Um, because the truth is, uh, I always th say that television is a luxury because it's like a great not it's like having a great book you get to you get to stay with the characters and watch them grow and 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 every night you you read a new part of their lives but for for me playing that role I had just gotten married Julie I Juliana and had a baby so my baby was 13 months old when I started that show and so I was going on this this journey that I had no idea <laughs> I was completely, there was no captain of that ship because I didn't know, I'd never been a mother before and I'd never been a working mother before and I'd never played this role before. So I felt like it was this great parallel um, journey. And what I learned uh, in my own life from the character I played uh, was that uh, no one's perfect and you can't do it all. <laughs> and I think that's sort of, I, I always find, you know, when people say, oh, she's amazing, not me, one. Someone else, um, you. Um, <laughs> she can do it all. No one can do it all. You can't. You can't be a great mother, a great lover, uh, an incredible actress. Show up on time. Be kind to everyone, and be this super. I don't understand the um, the idea that we can do it all. This sort of um, life work balance. I think that's bullshit. I, I really do. I think that someone suffers in the end, usually me, because I want to be that person who can do life work balance. And for some reason, that's expected of us as women, this, this idea that, I mean, I, I, rem <laughs> I remember once talking to my father on the phone on a Sunday morning. I had a baby at my hip and I was making scrambled eggs and my father, I, Said, he said, oh, I can't get the lid back on the jar of the jam. <laughs> and I, I go, Dad, I've got a baby on my hip. I'm flipping pancakes, and I'm talking to you at the same time. And he said, I know. Women can do it all at the same time. I can only focus on one thing. And it hit me that it's just sort of how we're we're geared to be able to do it all, but it doesn't mean it's joyful all the time, and it doesn't mean it isn't difficult or that we don't pay a price for it. So I think coming into my own as a woman, it feels really good the older I get to go, mm, no, can't do that. I, it, and that's okay, I don't judge myself for it. Hopefully whoever I'm talking to isn't judging themselves for that, ju judging me for that, because I can only do so much. And I think the beauty of aging is, is saying, 
that doesn't work for me. I can only, I'm only gonna do this, I'll do that tomorrow. But when I was in my 20s, 30s, 40s, I was just like, I can do everything. I have to show everyone I can do everything. I can do it backwards and in high heels. Yeah. It's amazing that you bring that up because it's one of the first things we address at the academy in the school. This idea of um, having it all. And this idea that for a woman, having it all means doing it all. Right. And I think that we are in a unique moment in history if history is to be expanded out further to include millennia. Um, it's a very awkward moment. Because why is it that having it all means doing it all and doing it all by yourself? Men don't have to do it all by themselves. So, okay, I see the look on your face. No, no, no. But, but, but I want to say something about that, okay? So, okay. like, wait. <laughs> History. History, right? History, right? What is the most incredible achievement a woman an ambitious woman, a woman with fire in her heart, a woman who wants the world in the last two, three millennia, what's the best way she could fulfill an iota of her hopes, dreams, and ambitions? To marry well. To marry well. Barring a few exceptions of famous courtesans or some queens that yeah. were absolutely immoral. <laughs> And that, and here's the thing, is that that conditioning, although we just went from being property to being able to own property, that transition has only happened in a few countries and has only happened like five minutes ago in terms of the span of human history. Yeah. And I will get to having it all and doing it all in a second. <laughs> um, so, like... That good girl conditioning mm -hmm. um, might as well be like a, a, a manual for women called How to Be Ma Marriageable, printed circa 1890. And this is what a good girl is, a good girl who hopes to be a good woman, who hopes to marry well, to fulfill her outrageously passionate ambitions for life through <laughs> marrying well. She is chaste, modest, accommodating. A virgin. A virgin until she finds the right partner. Then she's completely sexually available, but only mm -hmm. to that sanctioned partner. She makes do with what she has, right? She's resourceful. She doesn't ask for anything. She's low maintenance. Because to be a, a, a you know, good catch as a wife, you know, right. no outrageous desires, no big asks. She's resourceful. She makes do with what she has. She harmonizes. She makes the whole thing work. These qualities are fantastic qualities unless they're autopilot qualities, right? Like a, 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 a woman is so much more likely to reach in to solve a problem without even being asked to harmonize, to accommodate, to be low maintenance, um, to never ask, especially not big, outrageous, inspiring, visionary asks. So in recent times, there's been like a breakout character from the good girl, the independent woman. Mm -hmm. And the independent woman looks like she's not the good girl because she goes after whatever the fuck she wants but she does it all by herself. She may be running a company, but she doesn't ask for the team she needs. She's resourceful. And when she decides she wants to have a home life, she also does it by herself. She's still carrying that conditioning mm -hmm. of being accommodating, of making do with what she has. And if I were to ask the women in the audience to raise their hands, if you can relate to either being a good girl, an independent woman, woman or both, I'd like to see what happens. 
So like, is there any woman in this room who doesn't feel like she's in one of those two categories or both? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but that's I, I think that's a, a, what's interesting about, I mean, everything's interesting about what you're saying, and, and it's, it's very true. Um, I think we have been conditioned so much as the female um, sex to have categories. And I think that's the difference, right? Men don't have categories. So, so um, you know, because I was asked to come here because I got to play a role that honestly, I, I, it's the writing. I mean, the writer should be here, really. I just embodied that character. But um, this was a woman who was first in her class at Georgetown Law, right? She should have been running, a, she should have had her own law firm. But she sat back and let her husband, and what's interesting is in seven years, 156 episodes, we know that she's first in her class, but it was never said where, where, how the men did in, in school, Will Gardner or, or my husband, Chris Noth's character. And she sat back and raised the children thinking that she was being the good girl because she was put in the category. Well, you can't do both, honey, right? Let the man go stand behind the man, right? What's the song? Behind every man is a strong woman. Um, that was cute. Um, <laughs> but, but I've never once heard of a man being in a category. There's no categories for them, right? Men get to go to work. I was on a show for seven years. Chris Noth's son was one day old, younger than my son. They were the same age. And every press conference we went to, every press junket, the question asked to me, how do you juggle being a mom who's working all the time? Chris never got asked that question. Our children were the exact same age. Granted, he worked a lot less than I did, but... <laughs> but but, but the, the point was, was that I would walk away feeling bad. Yeah. I would walk away feeling like I was failing my kid that I wasn't home enough, that I wasn't being a good mother, that I wasn't being a good wife, and it would make me feel less than. Yeah. And the question was never asked, how, how is it affecting you being a father, Chris? And it never is. That's never the question. But working actresses, and I'm grateful for my life, and I love what I do, and I'm passionate about it, but I can tell you, dollars to donuts, every woman who has a child who's working in, in Hollywood gets asked, well, how do you find time for your family? And there is not one man that gets asked that question. Does Chris have a wife? He does. Well, there's your answer. Well, of course. <laughs> yes. And, that, and so those categories don't exist. And I think our job as females in today's world, is to stop having categories. How do you do that? You do what you want, right? Yeah, but you can't do what you want unless you get the support for it. But, but you have to, but we have to break those boundaries. So, so yes, you're absolutely right. But you can't really look for outside support. You have to feel confident. I could have said at those press conferences, and I would now, granted my kid is, almost 12 and doesn't really want me around that much, but, but um, I could have said, um, well, it's hard, but we all handle it fine, you know, we figure it out. I, instead of feeling bad about myself, I could have said, why aren't you asking Chris that same question? To stop the questions. Maybe it's my, my I have to change the, the direction of those questions. And when I say me, I say every woman who's asked those questions. Well, I'm pointing to something really specific because you're talking about another, yet another thing for you to do. On top of all of the things you have to do, all of the things you have to juggle, now you're going to steer the narrative in a different direction. Yet another thing for you to do. Ah, that's a good point. Okay, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Now, now, now I'm going to, I want to speak to the men in the room 
eventually, but first I, I want to speak to the women in the room. There are so many invisible support structures in existence that have developed over time for men to be able to do the thing they do, to go to work, to go to war. Right. Now women are stepping into new roles and still occupying the old ones. The old roles, old roles no longer have that support. Before, if you were a housewife, you, were, you had financial security, you didn't have to work. It may have been a terrible thing to be a piece of property, but some support structures existed. Now, going forth and occupying new roles, there's no support for those. Right. We don't have those invisible support structures. We don't have a wife. We don't have all the invisible things that, that in my classes I try to make visible, right? Even the, uh, if, just, just for a moment, if the women in this room thought, just thought, just about today, just about today, all of the invisible labor you performed on behalf of someone else who doesn't even know you did it, including any physical task you did that you weren't asked to do to make somebody else's life more comfortable, some kind of emotional problem solving that you did to anticipate somebody else's fuck up, like, and some mental thinking about how to prepare for a conversation in which you're going to ask for something that you're already entitled to. I've had, I've had women do logs of this, Sometimes it's 80% of your fucking time, right? And like, if you look at what, like, the hard work that men do, and men work hard, not a lot of that labor is invisible. As a matter of fact, this may be a stereotype, but a man picks something up and he goes, ah, this, I'm picking this up. Watch me pick this up. And like, in that span of time, in that span of time, you or I have like cleaned out the cupboards. Right. We've like sent 60 texts, we've checked on the kids, we've thought about our next career path, the next vision, right? Right, you're right. And it's invisible. And the thing is, is part of the good girl conditioning and independent woman conditioning, the thing from the centuries of being low maintenance and accommodating, da da da, means that we don't like to ask. You're right, you're Asking 100 makes us right. feel fucking bossy or yeah. needy. Or bitchy. Bitchy, right? Because once we, well, we really need something, by the time, did I really have to fucking ask? Like, right? Or, please, I really need help. It's like one or the yeah. other, right? Yeah. Okay, but here is the problem. If we are going to create new support structures for women, you're talking about categories, home, work, right? If we want to have it all, we can't do it all without an army. Right. And that is going to require learning how to ask, meaning command invite, entice. This is why I teach power and influence. And one of the first things we do is I teach women how to ask, mm -hmm. how to build the, all of the support from the people in their lives. Ask a woman how she's doing, what she wants, what she needs. I'm fine. I mean, one of my students reported back to me that she was taking her stroller down the subway stairs and was just thinking, oh, if one of these assholes would just help me down the stairs, I have a baby and a stroller and a train to catch. And a guy goes, hey, you need help with that? And she goes, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. Right. <laughs> and this is the thing. This is the thing. It's that, like, we have this incredible gift that's now a curse, right? Our mothers, their mothers, our ancestresses had developed a way for us to be safe. And it, it's called an, an attention on self that's <clears throat> largely not about like the attention on self of like meditation or visualization or getting in touch with your deepest desires. It's self-policing and self-attack. It's like, watch yourself. Mm -hmm. Because if your skirt's too short and you get raped, you'll be in trouble. Right. Right? So breaking through that, right, that, that, that I'm going to sound too bossy if I ask, I'm going to sound too needy if I ask, how am I being, is one of the huge, huge issues. And to be able to overcome that, to be able to overcome that and not just elicit and entice and command support for every endeavor, like, we're going at it, we're going it alone constantly. And another question to the audience. Who here is an independent woman 
who's fucking exhausted <laughs> and livid. And then, then there's the other issue, the other issue. And this touches the world of men and women, which is like, this is less and less true, but it's still true enough to hold water. You know, we grew up a certain way, and, and, and it's changing, but it's changing quite slowly. And it's, human beings have, have such a primal need to belong. And we get signals about what will have us belong from the moment we're born. But the way that we have been paying attention to girls and the way that we have been paying attention to boys is different. Mm -hmm. So for example, and this is really, really, really significant when it comes to the self-policing thing. So we have Billy and we have Mary, right? Billy and Mary are growing up. What do you say about Mary? Look how lovely Mary is. Look lo how lovely her dress is, her demeanor is, right? It's old fashioned, but it's been going on for long enough that it still influences, it still plays out. Look how she is. Then you have Billy, look what Billy did. Billy scored a goal, Billy made a mess. So Billy's agency is rewarded, whether it's positive or negative. Mary's being is mm -hmm. rewarded, whether it's positive or negative, whether she's getting chubby or whether she's, she's, she has a lovely smile. The problem isn't like the objectification of women and the over accentuation of men having to produce, not in the case that I'm about to make. It's that it impacts communication. It's part of what stops us from asking because our attention is in on ourselves and how we're being every time we're given that primal hit of belonging. And when boys, get that primal hit of belonging, they're in action, they're doing something, their attention is outward. So they tend towards having an outward commanding state of attention. And women tend to, especially in moments of duress, Me Too is full of this, moments when women froze, the, the attention was put on them, what do they do? They double down on attention on themselves. They froze in that state going, okay, I'm gonna say something, I'm gonna say something, I'm gonna do something, I'm blah, 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 blah. moments passed. Hands up the skirt, jobs given away. And this is the old conditioning. It's, 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 it ends up creating this thing where women are incredibly isolated in themselves, independent and isolated in an already excessively isolating world. You know, it's like the virtual dream that was supposed to connect us all kind of broke us all apart. And you add the conditioning of women to that and like female friendships can be one of the greatest things in the world, but to be able to have them is a jewel. Because essentially what we do when we get together with our female friends, we talk about how hard it is to do it all by ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's true. So. Um, the uh, incredible thing that men lose is that, I mean, you, you even listen to the language, right? Like, a presidential candidate that shall remain unnamed who happens to be president, <laughs> right? During, during the entire candidacy, listen, listen to how people talked about them. He's an asshole, but boy, he can get things done. Uh, what? Yeah. Okay, the woman. She's crooked and a liar. Never mind her entire history of accomplishments. We're obsessed with how women are and totally obsessed with what men do. Yeah. And what that means is that like every man is just a production machine. You are not supposed to have feelings. You're supposed to man up, get ready for thousands of years, sac sacrificing your life to go to war. Override your inner state. Don't go inward. Don't act like a girl. Man up. So the, the incredible loss of the ability to feel and gain the wisdom of what it means to go inside means, oh, if he's doing that, he's kind of being like soft and sensitive yoga dude and it's kind of gross. Why don't we cut his head or his dick off? And like a woman trying to occupy a position that's traditionally male is trying to man up. Only she can't. <laughs> And it causes all this turmoil, trying to do it alone. Neither way works. 
And, and one of the fundamental things is that, like, we need, to, we need to have both. We need to be able to have a full, rich, inner, acknowledged emotional experience. And we need to be able to have an outward expression that's connected. And when it comes to, for example, the stereotypical man and the stereotypical woman in a conversation, he will tend to use dominant language, dominant attention, bowl you over, unless you bite back. And so many women will end up freezing, harmonizing, accommodating, complying, without even knowing how it happened. And it's tragic. It's absolutely tragic. So, um, I really only meant to make the point that <laughs> <laughs> having it all is possible if you can sequester a coven, a tribe, an army, a community, a real community for doing it all. And one of the, you know, when, when people talk about the patriarchy, it's a word that's thrown around a lot, but I think one of the greatest, greatest, greatest tragedies of the patriarchy is the isolation. The John Wayne myth, putting, put, you know, pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. Mm -hmm. Sorry guys, but you know you're not doing it that way. You may be going to work, but you got support. <laughs> Even if it's like boys club, strip club support, or if it's like a wife, you know, <laughs> or not ha like, so <sighs> yeah, uh, having it all. So how do you change that? So because I think, um, I think what's important uh, is how we raise our children. And when I say that, um, I read this great, this great book called Raising Cain when I was pregnant and knew that I was having a boy because I come from a family of all girls and I didn't really know any kind of male presence in my house. My father had moved out when I was very young and so I didn't know boys in a house. And I wanted to understand how to raise them. And these, the book was great because it, these two um, doctors talked about how when boys are young and they cry, they're told, be a man. Yeah. They're three, yeah. four, five. Yeah. And they're told to suppress all their feelings, right? And then we and wonder girls, why we have so when they ma cry, male sociopaths running the world. <laughs> right. And girls, when they cry, it's, oh... Yeah. Right, so that's how they get attention. Yeah. And what was fascinating to me about reading this book was, and even in school, um, boys can't sit still the way girls can at the same age. They all come together at the same time, eventually. But they were saying how that when they, these, doc, these psychiatrists were called into schools to help with troubled boys, um, they realized these kids needed to run 10 laps around the field before they sat down for an hour math class. Whereas girls sit down, because they're good girls, and they sit down and they can do their math. They learn at a different pace and they learn differently. And as long as we keep raising boys to tell them not to have feelings and not to cry when they're three, four, five, even 13 and 14, they're going to grow up to be assholes. They're going to grow up and they're going to date some girl and she's going to say, you are so insensitive. And he's going to be like, uh, and he's not. I'm not it's not that I'm um, defending their behavior. I'm trying to show how it is we have raised such different genders. And it's only because of what you were saying before yeah. about what, what history shows us. And so I think that the, the step that we have to make, um, aside from trying to save ourselves now, is to change our ideas of raising children. Um, well, this is a boy and this is a girl and therefore they belong in this category. Because I'm, I, I have a son and when, when he cries, I always say to him, good, let it out. Because I want him to feel comfortable crying in front of me. I don't want him to think, oh, I'm, I'm now not a, a man. Which is, any man who cries in front of me is more of a man than, than a man who would yell in front of me, right? Because they actually can show their feelings. So I do think it's about how we raise our children and how we um, allow them to see the world instead of from what, what history has shown us that isn't working. Yeah. Because you're 100% right. Uh, and a, a friend of mine, um, her whole family, she has three kids and, and a great husband, and they were all at our house upstate, and, 
And the two husbands walked in and while well, she and I were talking in the kitchen and they announced what they had just done. <laughs> Claire, honey. And she looked at me after they left and she said, why do we need to know that? <laughs> She's like, if I listed the amount of stuff I do every day, we'd be here all night. And, and she said, it's almost like they need a pat on the back. Oh, thanks, honey. You know, like a pat of approval. And see, I, I pulled my share. But you're absolutely right. We, we, I, I, I would probably say 10 times a day I do it myself because it's just hard for me to ask. I know I'll do it better. Um, <laughs> it's true. And that's a problem, too. It is, uh, and I think for a lot of women who, who are overachievers, um, nine times out of 10, I know I'll do it better, so I just shut up and I do it. But it's not fair to him than if I get angry when he doesn't act, right? So, so it's, it's my responsibility, too. The same way it's their responsibility to take initiative. <laughs> but it's a strange way of communicating, Yeah. right? Um, and it's a difficult habit to break. It really is. I, I love that I my, make my own money and do my own thing and um, have sort of made my mark in this world before I got married and had, had a, a, a family of my own. Um, and at the same time, I see myself, it doesn't matter how, what my achievements have been. It doesn't matter that uh, I can afford my mortgage and pay for my parents and all the rest of it, it doesn't matter. I still will do it myself rather than ask for help when I'm too tired to do it myself. And, and that's something to really look, look at. And I think most women, I think you're 100% right, right. Nine out of 10 of us don't. I, I do have a couple of women friends who don't know how to do anything. <laughs> and I'm always, I'm always amazed. I'm amazed. I like come to their house and it shits everywhere. And, and, and these are, are um, a couple of my friends. They just weren't, uh, they didn't have a mother in their life. And the father threw money at the problem all the time. So they never learned to make their bed. They never learned to do anything for themselves. And they're stunned that I do housework, you know, mm -hmm. like wah, wah. laundry. You know, and I actually look at it as I'm, I'm glad I know how to do housework. I'm glad I can take care of myself. But I'm also raising a boy, and I say this to him all the time, you will not get to college and not know how to make a bed and make a meal and do your laundry. I'm not going to have you depending on anyone but yourself and, and know how to do it well. Yeah. But most guys my age did not grow up with that. Most guys my age don't know how to do their laundry. <laughs> but it's true. So I do think it's about, you know, reconditioning the already conditioned somehow. I don't know. But I, but I don't think it's an easy fix because... I think it's an easy fix. Well, I, I think it sounds easy, but I don't think it is ultimately when you are conditioned. It's hard to change your ways. The um, conditioning may take centuries to take hold in a culture. Yeah. But our natural state always wins out. The deck is stacked in our favor. When children are young, boy or girl, they have no trouble asking for anything. They'll right. ask for a pony. They'll ask for a castle. <laughs> They're innocently expressing their desires and their dreams. And they don't think about what it means about them. And the thing about... Um, the thing that the like the way I'd like to reframe asking, commanding, inviting, you know, is like, here's what I see, and I see this over the course of you know hundreds, thousands of students. God bless the independent women because they actually make this world work. However, depriving somebody of service that they could perform for you is not a gift to them. Depri what say that again. Depriving depriving so someone of serving you is not a gift to them. I know you said like. I can do it better myself. Right, 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 right. right. Okay. But like depriving someone, when you ask someone to perform a service for you, when you ask someone, you're inviting them into a need, into a desire, into something that's true for you. The bigger you ask, 
the more you elevate their role. Oh, yeah. So like what happens very, very, very often is um, especially the heterosexual married women who are independent, what they'll do is they'll ask less and less and less of their partners, do more, handle more quickly, like efficiently, multitasking, ask nothing until the role of the husband is that of a worm. Right, or and a then monster. they don't feel worth, worthy. They don't feel worthy because yeah. yeah. human beings, and especially men who've been rewarded for their agency, understand love through what they do. It's like yeah. the little prince story. Yeah. You know the little prince story? Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. like the little prince, he comes to earth, he waters his rose on his planet, and he sees all these beautiful roses, and he's asked, do you love any of these more? Are they more beautiful than the rose that you have at home? And he goes, no, um, it's that one, because that's the one I water, right? So it's like that the service is like the, the somatic, the physical experience of honoring and worshiping a woman that has a man be grounded since he's consistently rewarded, rewarded for his agency anyway, that has him understand his value. And what I see, and this is a very controversial thing to say, is I see these independent women let these men become worms, and then they go find a younger, incompetent woman that, that, that they can serve, that they can be effective with, that they can go and they're like, I can feel love here because I she, know love. Right. Right. through the expression of what I can contribute, what I offer. Right. right. And, um, <laughs> I mean, to say it's a simple fix, I, it, is, it is sort of, uh, um, let's say it's like simple but not easy. Yeah, I don't think it's easy. I think the people, you know, it's very difficult to change your habits and to change your ways. Um, it's hard to stay conscious of something all the time. But it's doable. You just have to stay conscious of it in the moment of when you're actually doing it. I do it all the time where I, I want to I wanna yell something, <laughs> something and I, you know, if my kid just, you know, kids will push you and, I, and I, I tend to walk out of the room and I'll go to the bathroom, shut the door and just take a breath because I don't want to regret anything that I can't take back that's going to harm him for his whole life. And then I'll think about what I'm, I want to really say once I calm down. And I go in and I say, listen, so this is why I got upset. And I can be rational. And he actually said to me the other day, I would rather you scream. <laughs> the silence is, is killing me. <laughs> but, but I understand that too. You know, I understand that too because suddenly I, I just shut up and I, I, walk, I go, and I walk out of the room. I, it's gonna be, you know, so now, I, I, now I'm thinking, oh, so now I, I need to say it, but I need to say it and I need to, I need to sound strong and I don't, wanna, I don't wanna fuck him up for his entire life if I say the wrong thing in a moment of anger as an adult. So, you know, it's, 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 it's not, it's, it's great to, to see it, but it's not so easy to live it. All right, uh, so let me tell you a story. <laughs> um, two things. The first thing is, as many of the meditators in this room can relate, Paying attention to attention itself is quite a trip. It's quite an experience. And in my training, becoming really finely attuned to where my attention is, to where it leaves the seat, <laughs> bringing it back. Having those incredibly intense, monastic, long-term experiences of attention itself. Yeah then going into a BDSM dungeon and having a sadomasochistic session, me as a young girl pretending I have all the power in the world, with a man twice my age who probably does have all the power in the world, figuring out, paying attention, and figuring out what I could do that would not just be play acting, that would work to actually have him feel like he could completely surrender under the dominant command of my attention. And it was a series of coincidences where I had just come back from a training 
And it was one of those rainy days where nobody was coming in, and it was a bunch of dominatrixes and crazy outfits, watching a rom-com, eating takeout, and I was like way too sensitive to participate. The this, this smell was overwhelming. And I picked up this dog training book. And in this dog training book, it was the only thing there, I picked up this dog training book. And I ate that book. In the book, the dog trainer was talking about how we forget that dogs are animals. We treat them like people. And we speak to them. But really what they respond to is an assertive, calm, dominant form of attention. And I, I, afterwards, I'd seen it so many times. Dog trainer walks into the room. The craziest dog calms down. And I started to understand that in a weird way, that's exactly what I was supposed to be doing in that room. Yeah, that it sounds like, about right. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that it was like all of the meditative power that I had been accumulating in the temple was now going to go 100% as a force of energy into holding and containing this energy body, observing it and commanding and leading it and noting every single move of resistance, every moment where there was just like really, really allowing them to reach a space where they could trust me, mm -hmm. that they were in good hands and they could surrender. You could see their body shift. They would blossom. The book of them would open and it was like an open book test. You would know what to do next. You would know what to say next. You would know how to lead them because there was enough attention there that would have them open up. Mm -hmm. And these hard shelled, armored, fighting, you know, corporate dudes would be on the floor, naked, suddenly turning into puppies. <laughs> and then I started training dominatrixes, training baby dominatrixes, you know, uh, for better or worse, it's kind of a terrible thing that in this country, like in order to be able to afford a college education, oftentimes you have to go look for work that's kind of in a gray area. So I have 19 year olds going like, all right, I'm ready. You've been a bad boy. Get on your knees. All her attention on herself, right? That body has not been moved. Kneel up. Okay, bark like a dog, right? Nothing's happening. It's just a person saying something and another person doing something. And I would start trying to teach them, okay, Put your attention completely out. Notice what just happened, his chest contracted. Ask him if that's grief, he starts to cry. All right, now he's a little baby. Are you gonna be his mother? Are you gonna be his governess, right? Pay attention. And it was so hard for them to get their attention out. It was against everything they had been, they're there in leather and latex, they have the room, but they can't put their attention completely out because it feels like they're invading the space of a man and it's so scary and crazy and taboo. They're supposed to keep to themselves, even when they're acting, acting like the world's most powerful woman in that room. What happened, what happened as a result of that is I started seeing it happen in life. It, it wasn't even just like the crazy text like, I don't know what this means. I was like, why don't you ask? Are you breaking up with me? Like, <laughs> but it was this, this way in which they were afraid to go, hey, what's going on right now? Like, no, no. It's like, I don't know if I'm doing it right. Da, 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 da. And it's not low self-esteem. Women do not love themselves less. They are not less confident. You can't say that the men who have power love themselves more. It's this lack of ability to meet because of the way the energetics work, the way attention works. So, one of the things, and this is the second thing I wanted to mention with, after my long story, is anger. Um, it is my belief that we live in a culture that does not understand how to handle the emotions that we consider to be negative. So take something like rage, and women are furious because they're withholding shit, they're not saying shit, they don't know how to say shit, like, I'm fine, I fucking hate you, they blow up later. We, we are not educated in the art of emotional alchemy and rage is one of the most taboo for a woman because you don't want to be a raging bitch. And you're nice and you're nice and you're nice until you're a fucking raging bitch. It's a lot like a limb falling asleep, right? Um, I don't believe there are any women out there that are not angry. If there are, there's like five of them. So like, <laughs> if you think you're not an angry woman, imagine your leg being asleep. And then there's this second phase that happens where the leg starts to wake up and it hurts. 
and you can't use it. That's the, the anger that's like kind of destructive and messy, and if you walk on it, you'll fall over. It's, it's, it's a disaster. Right? But that's just the second phase of rage. If your foot was in that state, would you go, oh, no, I got to put it back to sleep? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. But that's exactly what we do with anger. Like, we don't really feel it. It makes us sleepy, listless. We don't know what we're doing with our lives. Everything's tired. It's kind of all over the place. And then we get angry. I'm like, oh, this doesn't feel good. I can't. This is useless. This is destructive. I can't do anything with it. There's a third phase. There's a third phase that it, that's exactly like the foot coming fully awake. Anger leads. You do not get angry over things you do not care about. So there's a moment, there's an alchemical moment in anger where you stop seeing the thing you're fighting against and you start seeing the thing you're fighting for. And in that, anger becomes passion, becomes clarity, becomes commitment, becomes a greater vision. And even with movements like Me Too, people get stuck and I'm fighting against. I'm fighting against the predator. What predator? The predator needs help too. What's the vision behind that? What's the greater thing we're all aiming for? And that's the place where we stop. So sadness, depression, anxiety, anger. We, we stop at the middle phase. And there is a method that <laughs> many of you who are meditators of, of detachment through observation, it's, it's a wonderful way to roll. But to embody and fully go through and get to the other side means that we don't need to take you know, 17 deep breaths every time we read about another sexual predator with his 640 young raped girls. But, ah, I'm going to find my center. I'm going to find my center. No, we let ourselves give a fuck until we can get over this ah phase and get to a place where we're like, OK, the bigger vision includes everything from healing the girls, to healing the predator, to healing the system that makes both possible. And then all of a sudden, all of that anger, all of that rage exists for a reason. And if it's a small frustration, if it's a big frustration, it's the same. We don't get worked up over things we don't care about. We don't feel resistance when there isn't something precious inside of us to protect. And, and I think that like the, the lack of emotional education, and this especially affects women because we have been allowed to have this internal space. But we haven't been taught what to do with it. And men have not been allowed to have this internal space. So as they're now starting to more and more, with the exception of great artists, and, and you know, we have this like, ex, you know, exclusion, like men are allowed to have Men of that type are allowed to have, the non-warriors, the poets, they're allowed to have some kind of an emotional experience. And they're also allowed to be crazy and philandering drunks. Um, <laughs> but I think with these things, with these two things, um, what I'm talking about, when I'm talking about asking, um, it's really about confessing the truth of a desire or a need, and there's nothing more innocent than that. And when, when I'm talking about like emotional alchemy, you know, th this stops women so intensely. When, when I'm talking about getting over the other side, it's an incredible act of power. And these things are actually natural to us. So breaking the conditioning doesn't involve rewiring all these habits and creating new ones. It requires a little bit of practice and experience in doing something a little bit differently. Because I've seen it over and over again that when I have students who do things a little bit differently, they have a physical memory of that that's almost like a coming home. Mm -hmm. Like, wait, this is actually who I am. It's like the Wizard of Oz story, you know, at the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the beautiful, beautiful line when, like, <laughs> Dorothy goes, how do I get home? Click your heels three times. You could have done it at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. She goes, why didn't you tell me? Because if I did, you wouldn't have believed me. Right. And, and, that, and that's what I mean. It's just like, it is that simple. It may not be that easy because so many of us have gotten really attached to the incredible power of the victim role or the independent woman or all the wonderful manipulations that ensue. 
and have identified ourselves as superheroes. But the cost is huge. Yeah. And the innocence pays off. I think, no, I think that's a good place to take questions because it's. Is it time? Because we're getting that. Yeah. Right? It's always time. <laughs> it's always time to take questions. Because I think that's, um, that's what this museum tries to do, I think, in a, in a way. Uh, because you can't take anything for granted. And you've always got to question and re-relate to everything that's around you. And that's what this art tries to do. And it was so interesting what you were telling us about the perception of the male and the female and what they're expected to do. And what uh, Himalayan art, Buddhist art, tantric art does is it takes this sort of gender symbolism and brings it together in a yab yam, this bliss conjunction um, that is the perfect balance that we should all have. Not just because you're male or because you're female. No, each of us has that. And that's the attention that we should be paying to what we think of as both sides of our action and reception. Right, so balance. Anybody would like to ask a question? Raise your hand and we'll get a microphone too. Yes, right over there. And also in the first row, thanks, Lee. Hello, this has been wonderful, thank you. So much of what you've spoken about tonight has been between the male and the female genders. Um, but in my experience and in a workplace or in other environments, so much of the tension is really between women. So can you talk a little bit about how you're applying some of the things that you've talked about today in a, when you're working with somebody or struggling with somebody of the same gender? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, if, if we could call something like the patriarchy as a virus, it's spread through women almost worse than it is through men. Um, and just for practical purposes, when, when Ruben Flores, where are you? Ruben Flores and I started the school together. A, a school for women was started by a man and a woman. And not a single class goes by without a male volunteer. Um, it's easier to see the conditioning we carry when we meet with someone who has an opposing conditioning. But how we use that conditioning against each other is almost more vicious, more violent, more virulent than anything else. So there's the practical um, educational element, right? Like practice seeing how these different approaches happen with a man and a woman, a father and a daughter, a brother and a sister, because it's so obvious it's like a caricature. But with women, it, it demands a more subtle understanding because you have to understand yourself. You have to understand what you're carrying with you that's not you because your sister will be carrying the same thing. And there's a few really simple taboo acts, you know, self-celebration of raising each other up, of making sure that every conversation you have includes um, no downplaying of achievements, um, getting really clear on what's being said. You know, when, some, when, when another woman implies something, just straight up go, are you, it seems that you are saying this, is that true? Um, I could teach a course on it, and I do. But, um, <laughs> but, It's not that complicated, because at, at its root, it's like, you know what lights you up, and you know it doesn't. And when you can speak from the place that lights up, even if you're speaking to a place of darkness, man, woman, whatever, it starts being so easy to see 
that every complaint contains a desire. Every no hides an intimate, beautiful thing that wants to be protected, that you can touch if you're courageous and curious enough to. That um, every sideways snipe contains a, a hidden request. Again, it's subtler w woman to woman, um, but it's so healing and so waiting to happen. And in this world right now, we don't have time to have shitty conversations, manipulative misunderstandings, and you know, withholds. There's no time for that. The more powerful the conversation, the entire world appears to exist as a set of systems, the economic system, the justice system, um, religions, money, even money. All of these things are born out of agreements made in conversations. And many of those, most of those conversations happened without women. And most of those conversations were poor conversations. A powerful conversation can remake all of those things. Can remake all of those things. Uh, body, mind, and heart to by body, mind, and heart. Real conversation, powerfully influential can remake the entire world. And in that case, you know, power dynamics are gender neutral. It's like anyone can have attention out, anyone can have attention in. I start with women because I believe that women are the ones who are burning for it now. And when they do it, the inherent generosity of women means when they do it, they are inherently teaching men, they're inherently teaching other women, they're inherently doing it. It's spreading faster that way. They feel like they have something to gain, whereas men are afraid that there's something to lose. But really, everybody stands to gain. Um, Julian, I just wanted to, in the light of what you just heard, how did you react when you first saw the script for the final few episodes of, of The Good Wife? And uh, so those of you who haven't seen The Good Wife in all 56 episodes, the series begins memorably with a slap. Right. Oh. And it ends infamously with a slap. So it's bookended by betrayal. Male, female, female, female. So in the light of this relationship between women <laughs> and how that was scripted, how did it make you feel? Me personally? Um, as an actor, possibly as a person. Well, it hurt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a picture of my of her hand imprinted yeah. on my face. Yeah. Um, how did it make me feel? Personally, um, I always knew it was going to happen. Mm. Um, they told me from the beginning that they had seven seasons envisioned, and it would start with a slap and end with a slap. I just okay. never knew who it was going to be. <laughs> um, and I actually was really glad it was uh, Christine Baranski who did it. One, because she was trained at Juilliard and I knew she wouldn't break my jaw. <laughs> um, if it had been Chris Noth, I probably would have. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I love him. Um, but I, 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 it made me sad, to be honest with you. Mm. It made me sad because Alicia did exactly what, the reason she, I mean, it's opening up a can of worms, but the reason she slapped me was because I, brought up in court that her husband had been unfaithful. Um, and I won a case that way. And it was sleazy and horrible what Alicia did in a public space. And it, it, um, it devastated Diane. So in many ways, I feel like she deserved that slap. Um, I actually don't believe in physical violence. So I've, I, I, I've never slapped anyone in real life myself. But I, I understood it. Um, uh, and I knew it was coming, <laughs> so I had prepared myself um, mentally for it, you know, to understand why it was important for the kings to write that in. Um, and I sort of looked at it as a, an awakening. The same way the pilot starts, she wakes up out of her life, you know, she hits her husband, and it's like that slap is a wake-up call to her. I felt like when she gets slapped, uh, a lot of people took it as a bad thing. I, I saw it as a sign of she takes her jacket, she, that's her, she pushes it down, and she walks forward onto the next. And I didn't see it as a victim. I saw it as she was going to leave, leave that and, and find her own way. 
Thank you. Our next question. Yes, hello. Do you think it's uh, as simple? I mean, you mentioned that it's a simple. It's not easy, but it's simple to change. Do you think it's as simple as taking a physical action instead of holding it in? I know as a guy, I get nuts. When I start getting nuts, I got to do it. I got to do something, not necessarily in a fight or anything, but achieve, achieve something or complain or let somebody know. Do you, do you think that's, it's, as, it's that simple? What do you want to change? What do I want to change? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd like to, to change uh, mainly who's in the White House, but, uh, and who's running the Senate, but uh, I, I just, you know, whatever I want to change, whatever I want, when I want something or it's getting to me, I've got to do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I sit with it, Mm -hmm. so it'll work some maybe I can meditate maybe the, mm -hmm. but the best thing is for me to take an action mm -hmm. it, you know it can be anything uh, it depends on what I mean what do I want I want how are your relationships lots. with women in your lives eh, they're, you know they're alright <laughs> do you find them mysterious do I what do you find them mysterious at times Confusing, I, mysterious. I just asked you if this is a simple... I, I, <laughs> oh, no, you don't. <laughs> I need to know what you're asking me. I need to know what you're asking me. In order to know what you're asking me, I need to know where you're coming from, right? So you want to make a change. What kind of change do you want to make? No, I'm thinking you, that you're, you wanted to make a ch You were talking about making a change. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is exactly what I'm talking about. He's putting the attention on me. But no, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm commenting on your, I understand. your uh, suggestion yes, that yes. the solution yes. would be something simple, yes. maybe not easy. Solution to what problem? To your inability to express yourself. Okay, do you have an inability to express yourself? No. So the question doesn't come from you. You're asking that question on behalf of those you know who have an inability to, an inability to express themselves. Well, I'm telling you what works for me. Yeah, I know, and I know why it works for you, because you were raised a man. Right, but exactly. you can still make a choice, can't you? A choice about what? About taking an action, instead of holding do you, it in. Do you, do you understand that you don't actually have a question that's coming from a need that you have? Coming from a need? Yeah. Yeah, I do, I've got two daughters. Great, there we go. Ah. All right, <laughs> all right. Are your daughters mysterious to you? Yeah, oh yeah. Yes! <laughs> Jackpot. Well, yeah, all right. <laughs> all right, all right, no, 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 no. Let, let's, 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 let's be sloppy here, right? Just Guys are so fucking dumb and women are crazy bitches. Not at all. Okay. Um, Not at all who don't tell us anything, because they're always fine. Well, they don't talk to me much, that's for sure. Okay. <laughs> talk to the mother. So when your daughters, when you talk to your daughters, would you like to know more? I think so. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> your daughters look up to you. Uh, yeah, I think so, I guess, yeah. yeah, a little bit. They really do. So, what's your way of initiating a conversation with them that would allow them to feel safe enough to share with you the kinds of things you'd like to hear? Because the training for men is, is different from the training for women, right? Like, you're like, I'm ready to act. I'm ready to do a new, do, new behavior. What's the new behavior? It's not, like, no, it's not like I'm ready to do a new behavior or to act. It's that I need to. Okay. It's, it's, it's something that will relieve me Great. of certain problems you know, through physical action. Yeah, yeah. And there, I just thought it might be useful. Are there things that you could do for your daughters that would have them feel 
safe and wanting to open up and talk to you and share with you. Yeah, I'll probably just keep my mouth shut. Or ask them. Ask them. Ask them what? Ask them what you could do that would have them feel safer to open up and tell you more about themselves. Ask them what they need. Ask them what they like, what kind of father they would like to have, and make them be very specific. How did I end up in family therapy? <laughs> I mean, I don't dislike it, or, but, but... So one thing you could do in general, one thing you could do in general is when engaging, especially with women, all women, check in with them, especially when they go quiet. Ask them questions. It seems like you've gone quiet. What happened? Where did I lose you? Mm. Ask them questions. Oh, I do. I do. Good. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Um, we've got a question on the side right here, Levy, and then we've got a question in the first ring, uh, Dungeon. So let's go here first, and then we'll go to the side. Thanks so much. Thank you. So my question is, uh, when we learn how to, um, I'm going to ask in a more simple way, I think that there is a like s somehow like we women we came up and we are more the doers and more the um, some somehow I think we are learning how to be more dominant. Um, but then uh, how I don't know my question, but th this is a, is a it is a there is a question there. Um, I think that by being a bit more dominant, I think that women. Uh, there is like an invitation for men to be less dominant, but we don't like that, right? So I don't know exactly my question, but that's the question, you know? Okay. <laughs> we got it. Thank you. Okay. Do either of you want to respond to that? And I feel like this is her road. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning a whole lot just like <laughs> Okay, so I'm just gonna do a really short, play a really short game. Really, 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 really short. Um, power dynamics are entirely gender neutral. We associate the dominant state with masculinity, so when we go into a dominant state, we end up acting like men for no fucking reason. Men who wanna go inwards and explore the feminine side do the same bullshit. So it's like, okay, here. Submissive state of attention done in the most masculine I could possibly do. Are you ready? I am a man. I believe in my dream. I believe every word I say. Will you join my cause? <laughs> That's a submissive, inward, I'm talking about myself, done in the masculine. Now, super feminine, dominant. Hi. You have the most beautiful earrings I've ever seen. Your earrings are so gorgeous. You have sparkling earrings right next to your cheekbone. Take your hands. Wrap them around your hair. Do that now. <laughs> lift up, lift up that hair. Yes, good, good. Lift up that hair. Show me those earrings and those collarbones. <gasps> Wonderful. Oh yes, and giggle like that again so your titties shake just a little bit. <laughs> so good. You're such a good submissive, aren't you? You do everything I say. See what I mean? Yeah. Dominant state of attention commands instructions. 
submissive state of attention, completely inward experience, inviting others to come in, masculine, feminine. Wow. Thank you. I had no idea that masculine and dominant are not the Nothing same. Nothing to do with each other. Wow. <laughs> you can you. play that game however you want. It's just attention out, attention in. Just what? Attention out, attention in. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> People, you should know, those earrings can also be purchased at the show. <laughs> so, while you've all been paying attention to what happens on the stage and in the front row here, uh, my attention has been split ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. uh, while I've been fascinated by what has transpired, I'm also keenly interested in how the clock is making a digital resonance above us and indicating that we have time maybe if these questions and answers are going to be so expansive for just two questions and there's a microphone already in the hand of somebody here. Yes, thank you. So, just a second, just if you don't mind. So, whoever would like to ask the last question, here's a little challenge, Grant. Who has never asked a question in public? <gasps> Think about that, and if you haven't, raise your hand, and we'll get a microphone to you. Oh, yes. that's so good. Um, well, what I'm going to say probably is far more boring than that excellent little skit, but I, I thought the origin of when you said something was simple but not easy related back to Juliana raising a 12-year-old and saying, how does it change, if I'm not mistaken. And what I thought I heard was in the beginnings of a young man um, discovering his own sexuality, that these roles start to take place and that women have become objectified. And I don't know how you really take that part out of the DNA of a man, if you think it's there. Uh, this is more of a heterosexual statement maybe, but I thought it was more about child rearing and how do we change culturally how women are perceived in those good girl roles, good women roles. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, to be honest with you. I'm, I, um, my, my feeling, just as a parent of a 12-year-old, is um, I, I like my son to see me go off to work. I think it's important for him to see me go off to work. I think it's important for him to see my husband and I um, share the, the responsibility of the home. Um, I think it's important for him to see that we're on equal footing in our marriage. I think it's really important for him to see that my husband would never speak down to me, and that I would never speak down to my husband, that we have a harmonious place to be, but that, you know, we're also very strict. Um, I don't want to, you know, I think it's good to have boundaries. You need to with children. Um, they crave them. But the boundaries don't, at least the way I'm trying to bring him out up in the world, they, they don't, um, it doesn't matter if he was a boy or a girl. It's, it's you treat people. And actually, he, he said something to me. I mean, this is also a New York City kid, you know, but I think kids are so perceptive. And, and we were walking a long, long way. We were in, in Europe, and, and it was nine, up to nine miles. And I said, honey, let's just grab a cab. And he goes, no, mom, we can do it. We can do it. And I said, fine, we're going to just, we're just, we're just going to um, man through this. <laughs> and he said, what? Nice. And he and I said, "Oh, we're gonna woman through it." And he goes, "Mom, we're gonna power through this." <laughs> and I, I thought, well, maybe, maybe, maybe we're doing our job. You know, he's teaching me because he's only ever seen what I, I'm, we're trying, how we're trying to raise him. So, so, and now he's teaching us. Okay, one, one last question. Uh, who would like to ask it? Okay, right in the back. Hello, we're going to get a microphone to you right now. Thanks so much. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, I just want to say, after today, when I text my male boss, I will no longer say, sorry to bother. I'm just going to say what I need to say, and I'm not bothering anyone when I'm asking a general statement about the job I'm hired to do. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> is an exhibition and demonstration of 
change, <laughs> right? Somebody came to the Reuben, they experienced an exchange, and they saw the way they could change. And that's hopefully what you will always get in some way, shape, or form here when you come to our little foothills of the Himalayas in Chelsea. Uh, <laughs> so, so, because we've got a few high mountains to climb, and we want to get as prepared as possible. And so I'm going to prepare you um, for what's happening next year, because we've been talking a lot about change and exchanges of dynamics on stage and within our audience. And we're going to be talking about the nature of impermanence and that we have to, if we're going to survive as a society, we have to really embrace the fact that change is inherent in not just who we are, but everything that surrounds us. And working out those navigations is going to be our journey that we're going to chart with everyone next year. So I hope you'll join us with that. So an agent of change who is admittedly um, illustrated as male in the uh, Hindu pantheon, but has sort of had a few truncations, quite literally. He bears a trunk, but has lost half a tusk, and rides from the darkness on the back of a little mouse. An elephant riding on the back of a mouse is kind of ridiculous, but it shows you that sort of easy, simple dynamic, too. He's called Ganesh, and he's known as the remover of obstacles. And this is a museum of art. So we should give, I think, a little art to the great artists who have graced our stage tonight. And so, I did say little, and this is a science of them, but these are little Ganesh carved out of stone, and they're portable. You can take them wherever you want. And so, Kasha, I know one of your favorite colors is very akin to this. Yeah. So this is for you. Thank you so much for being an agent of change for Thank so you. many people. I've seen you in action, not just here, but you know elsewhere. And it's pretty impressive. <laughs> and Juliana, um, you are a chameleon in your many, many roles. Mm -hmm. And if you enter the doors of the mandala through the green door, you represent water, which of course can change, shape, and adapt, and be what it needs to be in order to affect a dynamic relationship. And so therefore, that's, you do that on screen, you clearly do it at home, and <laughs> this is for you. Thank you so much for coming. So all we can say to you now is go outside into the world, or yeah, you can go to the galleries actually, go to the shrine room on the fourth floor, till nine o'clock we're open, uh, take that in, and then leave if you will, and leave knowing that you have the ability to change the world around you because the world around you is already inside you, right? And you don't need to do anything to change it, you just need to be that change, and it will happen. So let's do it together. Okay. Good night.